Hello and welcome to Castles and Legends. Today we're at Bodium Castle. It is undoubtedly one of the most picturesque and iconic castles and one I've been wanting to visit for such a long time. The late medieval castle was constructed in 1385 by the ambitious knight Sir Edward Dalingridge at a time when England was at war with France, known as the Hundred Years War, and there was a real possibility of a French invasion. While Bodium Castle's appearance certainly suggests a formidable defensive structure, historians debate whether it was primarily built for defence or designed as the ultimate country manor. What is clear, however, is that Bodium Castle exudes the image of a perfect fairy tale castle, capturing the imagination with its enchanting and storybook like beauty. Long before Bodium Castle ever existed, a small Saxon manor house was situated on the lands. Following the Norman conquest of 1066, these lands passed to the Bodum family. The story of the castle itself begins in the late 14th century with Sir Edward Dalingridge. Edward was the younger son of Roger Dalingridge and therefore did not stand to inherit his father's wealth. Faced with this situation, he embarked on a journey to forge his own fortunes, a quest in which he succeeded admirably. In 1367, Edward travelled to France to fight in the Hundred Years' War, a war between England and France over the succession to the French throne. He fought successfully and brutally, accumulating a vast wealth from the pillaging and ransoming of wealthy French prisoners. Edward returned to England in 1377 and in 1378 he married Elizabeth Wardu, heiress of the Bodium lands. King Richard II bestowed considerable honours upon Edward, appointing him Knight of the Shire of Sussex between 1379 and 1388. Additionally, in 1392 he was appointed Warden of London, elevating him to a position of great influence and making him one of the most prominent nobles in England during that era. Edward's ascent in status was not without challengers. In 1372, John of Gaunt, the third surviving son of King Edward III, was granted lands in Sussex. Dalingridge and other landowners in Sussex, fuelled by resentment, launched a concerted effort to exert pressure on John of Gaunt. The tensions escalated to the point where Gaunt took legal action, filing a lawsuit against Dalingridge in an attempt to restrain him from interference. Dalingridge's conduct in court, where he defended himself, was marked by violence and unruliness, providing insight into his personality. Twice during the proceedings, he dramatically threw down the gauntlet in a bold and confrontational manner. This behaviour offers a glimpse into the assertive and combative nature of Dalingridge. Edward lost the lawsuit and received an order to be kept in custody until a £1,000 fine was fully paid. Fortunately for Edward, he had an influential patron, the 11th Earl of Arundel, who successfully intervened on his behalf with the King. As a result, Edward swiftly returned to Parliament without ever settling the fine. In the 1380s, the Hundred Years' War between England and France continued with renewed hostilities. In light of a persistent threat, the English Parliament sanctioned the allocation of funds to strengthen fortifications along the southern coast of England. This strategic move aimed to enhance the country's defences against potential French invasion. In 1385, a fleet of 1,200 ships gathered on the French side of the English Channel, 
it looked as though a French invasion was imminent. That same year, Edward was granted a license to crenellate, that is to fortify his manor house. Edward's estate at Bodium was situated in the valley of the River Rover, which, during that period, was sufficiently wide and deep to accommodate sizeable ships, allowing them to sail as far as Bodium. Rather than fortify his current manor house, Edward built a magnificent new castle from scratch. Edward's castle was built to a simple rectangular plan, with four circular drum corner towers reaching 60 foot high. The towers were linked by a curtain wall two stories high. In the northern wall, a vast twin-towered, three-story high gatehouse stood, but there was another entrance to the castle, through the postern tower in the south wall, although this no longer exists. A square tower was also situated along the west and east walls. The castle was strategically constructed on marshland, and a deliberate flooding of the area was executed to create a moat that entirely envelopes the castle. This design not only added to the fortress's defensive capabilities, but also contributed to its imposing and picturesque appearance. Anyone thinking of attacking the gatehouse would have had quite a challenge. They would have had to cross a wooden bridge to a small island known as the Octagon. They would then have had to get over a drawbridge which led to a barbican and then get across another drawbridge before they even reached the gatehouse. The gatehouse itself was a formidable structure, equipped with three portcullises, gun holes and murder holes. These features serve both defensive and offensive purposes, allowing defenders to thwart and repel intruders by various means, including pouring down materials through the murder holes on anyone who managed to breach that far into the castle. Within the castle walls, there was no central keep. Instead, all of the castle's structures were built along the curtain walls. This architectural layout contributed to the castle's unique design. While Bodium Castle's defensive features are prominent, historians hold conflicting views regarding its primary purpose. Some argue that the castle was constructed primarily for defensive reasons, given the turbulent times. However, an alternative perspective suggests that Bodium served as a luxury country manor, showcasing Sir Edward Dallingridge's elevated status and providing a symbol of prestige and wealth. The dual nature of the castle, with its defensive capabilities and opulent design, makes it a subject of historical debate and interpretation. Buildings within the castle walls included essential facilities such as the Great Hall, Chapel, the Lord's private chambers, kitchens, pantry and buttery. Notably, Edward Dallingridge's private hall and chambers were strategically situated, allowing him to have a view of the castle chapel's altar and attend worship while maintaining a degree of privacy from the castle's garrison. In later restoration efforts, it was revealed that Bodium Castle boasted an impressive 33 fireplaces and 28 lavatories. The lavatories were designed in a manner that emptied directly into the moat. This intriguing historical detail implies that the serene moat we admire today served a less idyllic function in medieval times, essentially functioning as an open sewer system for the castle. Bodium Castle is noteworthy for its large windows, a departure from the typically dark and sombre atmosphere of most medieval castles. Although these windows allowed for more natural light, creating a brighter interior, they did come to a cost to the castle's defensive capabilities. The larger openings made it more vulnerable to potential attacks. The exact date 
of the castle's completion is unknown, but it is suggested to have been finished by 1392. Regrettably, Sir Edward Dallingridge did not have much time to enjoy his splendid new home, as he had passed away by 1395. Bodium Castle passed to Edward's son, John Dallingridge, who, like his father, enjoyed the favour of the king. Upon John's death in 1408, without any heirs, Bodium Castle transitioned through various members of the Dallingridge family. Philippe Dallingridge married Sir Thomas Luckner, and their son, Sir Roger Luckner, eventually inherited Bodium. Consequently, the castle passed into the hands of the Luckner family. In 1455, the War of the Roses began, and Sir Thomas Luckner, son of Sir Roger, sided with the House of Lancaster. However, when Richard from the House of York ascended to the throne as Richard III in 1483, Thomas faced accusations of treason and of raising men-at-arms in southeastern England. In November 1483, Thomas's own uncle and Thomas Howard, the Earl of Surrey, were granted permission to gather troops and potentially lay siege to Bodium Castle. Records do not confirm whether the siege was executed, but it is believed that Thomas surrendered the castle without a struggle. Bodium was confiscated and Nicholas Rigby was made constable of the castle. The tides turned in the War of the Roses and in 1485, Henry VII of the House of Lancaster was crowned King of England. With Henry's ascension, Bodium was returned to the Lucner family. Although we know the castle was back in the hands of the family, there is very little to indicate how the castle was used over this period. During the onset of the English Civil War in 1642, Bodium Castle was owned by the Royalist John Tufton, 2nd Earl of Thanet. Engaging in hostilities, John led an attack on Lewis and participated in the Battle at Haywards Heath, which resulted in a victory for the parliamentary forces. As a consequence of his involvement, Parliament imposed severe penalties on John, confiscating his lands and imposing hefty fines. To meet the financial obligations imposed by Parliament, John was forced to sell Bodium Castle in 1644. The new owner, Nathaniel Powell, was a parliamentarian. After the English Civil War, a practice known as slighting was common, involving the deliberate destruction of castles to prevent their military use. Despite being owned by a parliamentarian, Bodium Castle did not escape this fate. Following the war, the Barbican, bridges and buildings within the castle were intentionally destroyed, contributing to the broader effort to neutralise the military capabilities of castles across the country. In 1722, Bodium Castle was purchased by Sir Thomas Webster, for over a century, the castle and its surrounding estate stayed in the possession of the Webster family. During this period, the site began to attract attention as an early form of a tourist attraction, thanks to its historical ties to the medieval era. The first illustrations and depictions of Bodium Castle emerged in the mid-18th century, portraying it as a picturesque ruin adorned with ivy. In 1829, John Fuller, also known as Mad Jack, acquired Bodium Castle Estate for £3,000, equivalent to £280,000 today. Commencing some restoration efforts on the castle, it is believed that Fuller bought the castle to prevent the Webster family from dismantling it entirely for the reuse of its stone. Later, in 1849, George Cubitt purchased the castle, furthering the restoration work. He conducted the first detailed survey of Bodium Castle in 1864. In 1916, Lord Curzon, who had been actively seeking to acquire Bodium Castle, 
finally got his hands on the estate. Immediately upon ownership, Kazon initiated a comprehensive program of investigation and restoration. He undertook the drainage of the moat, revealing the original footings of the bridges and uncovering numerous artefacts. Within the castle, stonework underwent repairs and the floors were levelled. Upon Lord Kazon's passing in 1925, he bequeathed Bodium Castle to the National Trust through his will. This generous gesture ensured the National Trust could carry on the work of restoration and preservation for the captivating and historically significant castle. Today, Bodium Castle is still looked after and preserved by the National Trust and run as a tourist attraction for the public to visit. If you're a Monty Python fan, then you might also recognise the castle from the famous 1975 film, Monty Python and the Holy Grail. Visiting Bodium today has been well worth the wait. It is truly something out of a storybook, a fairy tale castle. I hope you have enjoyed exploring with us as well. Please do give us a like and subscribe if you've not already. I hope to see you very soon on our next adventure.